land. We would like to acknowledge that we are on indigenous land, the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, people that are still here, continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. And Tonight, Alvin, we'll Alvin, one more I'm thing. Sorry. I'm not seeing the closed captioning down at the bottom. Would you be able to turn that on? Yes. Thank you. All right, I think we should be good to go. All right, so tonight we will talk about everything from youth gun violence prevention, the role of civilian community service officers, homelessness, and of course, a discussion with you about our poll on community safety. But we begin this evening with an update on the highest COVID-19 surge to date in the state and county, forcing Governor Inslee to impose new restrictions. And joining us for the breakdown of the latest numbers and restrictions is Becky Reitzis, who is with Public Health Seattle King County. Becky, good to have you join us again. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you. And as Becky is talking, please add any questions to the chat and we'll try to get to them during the Q&A after we ask her a few questions. So, Becky, with the rising amount of cases um, in the county, can you tell us a little bit more about the numbers that are out there and then what What's the best way to stay healthy right now? Great. So um, unfortunately, the numbers have been going up since late September. I know that you have a couple of slides if you wanted to show slide, um, the one with the graph. So you can see uh, how, how much the growth has been around mm -hmm. folks getting COVID and having test results that show they have COVID. And then if you could show the other result, uh, I'm sorry, the other uh, slide that I sent you. Um, and we are at the highest count that we've been since the uh, pandemic has started. The good thing is hospitalizations have not um, are not at the highest currently and deaths are not currently at the highest, but the cases are currently at the highest. So we are concerned about, um, about a lot of things about people being sick and people not doing well. And then also concerned about the hospitals uh, getting um, getting busier as they were in the past and, and filling up. So definitely biggest concern is that we have more people with COVID today than we've had before in King County. Becky, can you talk a little bit more about the reason behind the spike in COVID cases? Yeah, I mean, I think oh, there's a lot of reasons behind the spike. We have seen um, folks, and I think one of the big reasons is we've seen a lot of co what, what folks are calling COVID fatigue, that folks are really tired of wearing face coverings and masks. And folks are also, some folks are going back to schools. Uh, some folks are doing gatherings and they are not, you know, maybe they're tired of not gathering or maybe they are just you know, wanting to be with friends. So a lot of, and then we have loosened the restrictions. Um, and unfortunately with some of the loosening of the restrictions and the rise in numbers of folks getting COVID, it is all kind of a perfect storm. So um, unfortunately, you know, one of the biggest places that we're seeing folks get COVID is from, um, from gatherings and from gathering together with with friends and family and then passing it very quickly in those situations and then bringing it back into community, into um, restaurants, into bars, into, you know, back like into their community with friends. So unfortunately that's where we're seeing things happening. Thank you, Becky. <laughs> Um, so I know I know there's a, a few people in my family um, who have been exposed to COVID recently. Um, how long after exposure should you go take a COVID test? Well, so this is one of the things with COVID that's really unique. And I know that we talked about this um, a lot last time. Uh, so for folks joining us again, um, bear with us. So with COVID, one of the things that, that um, happens is that folks are often um, able to pass the virus two days before they show symptoms, if they show symptoms. So this is one of the issues. And they can also have symptoms up to day 14, which is really unique, uh, 14 days out from being exposed. And that's pretty unique to COVID. It's really different than other flus and viruses. Um, and they can test positive up until that point as well. And so that um, they're most likely to test positive or to show up on a test that they have COVID when um, when they have the most virus in their system. So it doesn't always show up in the first 
few days because that's not when they're going to have the most virus in their system. Um, the tests really do look for the virus and they need a lot of it for the tests to find it. I know there's been a lot of confusion around it and some high level like sort of celebrities talking about how, you know, they tested yesterday and they were fine and they tasted today and they're not, or they did three tests and one showed one thing and two showed another, but it's, it, you know, the tests aren't hundred percent effective and it's about how much virus we have. So it's, it is complicated. Can, to, add on, to add on to that question, um, do you feel like, because I've, I've heard uh, different things as far as testing um, with some of the, I know there's like the, the quick testing and then there's one that takes a little bit longer. Have you guys seen any um, changes with the, the results of those tests at all? Yeah. Like other ones that are more um, like. Yep. Uh, the, there's, so there's a rapid test, which you get the results back, I believe, within like 30 minutes. And then there's a test that can take, you know, anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. Um, I know when we were really backed up in the beginning and still getting tests, it took a lot longer, anywhere up to five days. Now we're really seeing them come back within usually 24 to 48 hours. The tests that take longer to come back are actually more effective. So they have, um, they, they're just a little bit better of a test. Uh, Yes. I don't know if better of a test is the right way to say it, but they're going to be more accurate. Right, right. That's a good way to say it. They're more accurate. Right. Um, with the new orders from the governor um, around um, everyone staying in place and uh, social distancing, um, do you think that um, – what what are what are some of the rules around like food banks and food pickups distributing food? Um, what what kind of things that should should they do to protect themselves and protect protect people who may be coming to get food? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one thing I do want to say before you had mentioned like the new restrictions, so I do want to make sure to say that we are recommending and, and the governor is recommending and so is public health that folks are not having gatherings together um, around the fall holidays. Um, and at the same time, we're, it, people are still able to go get food if they need it. So I'm going to put some resources in the chat after we're done chatting. It's a little hard to multitask and copy and paste them and put them in. Um, but we do still have a lot of places where folks can go and get free food. They can go get it. They can go help distribute it. They can donate. Um, and so a lot of the places are doing uh, drop off and, um, and pick up a pre-prepared food. And so they can pick up sort of food packages. The big thing to say is that each place is a little bit different. So on the King County website, again, I'll share a link um, where we have a whole list of all of the different food banks and food distri distribution centers throughout King County um, where folks can, and, and I'd recommend folks going to their specific like the site of the place that they are either looking to volunteer at or looking to get food from and going to their specific website and find out what they need to do. Um, I will say that all of those places uh, are following really strict guidance around um, food handling and safety and how to stay safe around um, COVID. Thank you, Laura. Or Becky, sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then one question before we head over to the community Q and A. Um, there's a lot of talk about the vax, the vaccine being right around the corner. Have you heard any news about the vaccination or um, when they'll be available to first responders and high risk populations? Yeah, uh, you know we're hearing. I, I'm not going to give any solid days because then someone's going to be like, well, Becky said it's going to be on this date. But we do see, believe that um, in early spring, we'll probably have a, um, a vaccine. There's two ones uh, that are looking very promising, um, two vaccines that look very promising. Uh, I think one of the confusions out there is that, you know, when the vaccine is developed, it doesn't mean it's automatically going to be in the community. And so, you know, that's the hard part about the vaccine is that the first round that we're going to get is going to be actually pretty small for Washington State, um, the, the amount of vaccine Washington State will get. And that's going to be really reserved for folks who are first responders and also folks who are immune compromised. So it will take a while for the development of enough vaccination or vaccine to get it out into our communities. So this is why prevention right now um, is really the strongest message we can get. And Alvin, you had asked me a question like, how do we stay safe? 
mm -hmm. earlier, I, um, and I didn't quite dive into that. So just to talk about the prevention piece a little bit is, you know, folks still need to be wearing face covering and masks, um, need to be staying six feet apart from other folks, even when they're wearing the face covering and the mask. What I see is folks often think it's like an either or, and it's really best practice to stay six feet away and be wearing face covering or mask that covers the nose and the mouth. We wanna wash our hands. Um, for 20 seconds with soap and water or use hand sanitizer in between. So um, until we get the vaccine widespread, which honestly will probably be further out than spring. Um, how's that for a, a vague answer? But it, it, it's probably not going to be widely dis distributed until further out than the spring. I mean, we're, we're thinking later than that. And it just takes a while to get it out in the community um, and get enough of it in our in our states and all of the states to get it out widespread in the community. So in the meanwhile, this is a very preventable virus and we need to do all of those things I just mentioned in order to, to not get it. Thank you, Becky. That information was very helpful. At this time, we would like to turn things over to the community for questions. Feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Please share your name if you choose to speak out loud. And we do have one question in, in the chat that came up. Um, I'm not sure if Becky answered this already. Are food banks subject to the same 25% occupancy rule? Do you know that, Becky? You know, and that's an answer I, will ha I have been so, uh, trying to find out. And so I'd have to look that up and find out. Um, okay. One of the things I'm gonna do and that's, uh, is just, again, put a bunch of the different links in. Um, I, what I'm seeing is a lot of folks are really doing the pre-prepared so folks can just come and pick it up. And so they're not hitting those, those occupancy numbers. Um, but I apologize, I don't know that, that number off the top of my head. Okay, um, if anyone else has a question, feel free to put it in the chat or unmute yourself now. If you're on the phone, I think it's a star six to unmute. Mm -hmm. One other question that we did have is, um, let me see, where is it? As far as, can you clear up, Becky, if wearing a mask protects the, protects the person who's wearing it from others, or is it mainly to protect other people? You know, there's really new evidence uh, that shows both. So I like to think about when I wear a mask, I'm protecting other folks because it's covering my mouth and my nose and preventing droplets from coming out of my body into their body. Um, but it's still protecting us from having droplets go into our mouth and nose as well. So it really is both. Um, you'll definitely see some folks wearing like face shields as well because if we get droplets into our eyes, that is also a way that, that COVID can spread. But if the other person is wearing a face covering, it's protecting that like me from getting droplets into my eyes. So it really does both. Um, and, and yeah, it does both. I do like to think about though, when I'm wearing a face covering, I really am protecting other people in my community as a huge piece of it. One thing um, we didn't mention was that there are some new flu clinics um, that ha are in Seattle and it's really, I'm sorry, flu vaccine clinics, I should say. Um, and it's really important for folks to know that we do have free flu vaccine clinics. Um, and right now uh, with with COVID, we are really recommending even more than we usually do at Public Health for folks to get uh, a vaccine the flu vaccine um, and this way they're not confusing the symptoms with COVID or the flu and they're making sure to like to to not get both which can really cause complications in the body so I, I would love for folks to know that there are free clinics here in Seattle uh, and so I put that link in in the chat and you'll see I put a number of links in the chat as well. Becky I have a question for you so as I drive around uh, the neighborhood I see some uh, restaurants and um, and like breweries or bars that set up outdoor like tents. Um, what are the what are the guidelines from King County in regards to? I've seen some tents that are all closed up, that they make them look like it's a greenhouse. Um, mm -hmm. But I've also seen tents that have you know n almost no walls on them. So yeah. what, is there any any guidelines that the county is enforcing or recommending for people? You know, is it safe for me to go into like a kind of like a greenhouse, or is it not safe for me to be even outdoors in one of those tents? Yeah, so we're recommending that they're going to have some of those sides open, um, we, and usually it's screens versus having a solid closed. Because again, that's going to be 
more like an indoor gathering if there are sort of four walls. So you do want air moving, um, and that's why it's, it's okay to have them outside versus having them inside. So right now with the restaurants and bars are not, um, they're not able to have folks inside. They can have them outside and they can have that covered and they can have some of the walls closed, but you do need to have some of them um, more screens so that air can be moving. And those are also pretty strictly regulated on how many people are allowed at each table and the spacing of it as well. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry. I'm looking at I'm, I'm, the reason I'm looking away is because I'm also looking at both at another screen that has a lot of information on it for me. No, no worries. Thank you. Yeah, no, that was informative. Okay. Uh, I will. I will. So the one thing I was going to say is I know that folks are really mm -hmm. upset about the bars and the restaurants closing, um, and and it's devastating. It's devastating for small businesses. It's devastating for the employees. And it is one of the places that we know um, folks are not wearing masks while they're indoors, and they're more likely to pass it indoors. So it's definitely a riskier setting than than the outdoor. So one of the things we recommend is like, you know, to support these businesses and you can do takeout, um, but it's if the eating inside the business is not going to be recommended, unfortunately. Thank you, Becky. I feel like we could, we could talk about COVID-19 for this whole hour and a half with all the information that is new or basically we could talk every day for an hour and a half about it but we really appreciate you coming back and telling us the latest on it and thank you for um, pasting the the information in the chat as well and we are going to move on to our next um speakers cool thank you so much thank you becky thank you becky osbaldo thank you laura in addition to our guest this evening, we would like to have you join us in a conversation about community safety. If you have been to our website, you might already be familiar with this evening's question. If not, no worries. We have created a poll to find out if you feel safe in your community. And we also would like to discuss how you define community safety. Please weigh in as we hope to have some robust discussions with you during our time together. Again, this is a conversation for you and about you. For those of you who are joining us by calling in, please wait to provide your answers for later during our open conversation time. This is because the platform we're using does not allow call-in users to enter answers into the poll. The poll will be open for the first 20 minutes or so to allow for folks to join in later. There are two questions. One is a multiple choice and one open-ended answer. Make sure to complete both questions before you press submit because you cannot add or change answers once they're submitted. We are now opening the poll. As the City of Seattle engages in conversations about defunding the police, there are a group of civilian employees known as Community Service Officers or CSOs. The role is to help residents and businesses calling for non-criminal reasons, navigate services, engage with communities, and support are at eat risk youth. So joining us this evening, we have to help us learn more about the role of the civilian community service officers, also known as CSOs. We have um, Chris Anaba and Kelly Van Dyke. Chris and Kelly are CSO supervisors. Good to have you with us, Chris and Kelly. Yeah, thank you for having us, Laura. Thank you. So we'll have a couple of questions for you. Um, and again, thanks for joining us as well. And uh, my first question is, I know that, you know, the, the, a form of the of the program CS, the, you, it used to exist uh, that then ended, but obviously you're, you're back. Um, so we wanted to, to kind of just educate community on what the CSO program is. And so my first question to you is, what is the difference between just a regular traditional police officer and a CSO. So the main difference is that CSOs, we don't have any authority, so we don't hold any enforcement. <clears throat> With that being said, uh, we do a lot of education, a lot of outreach. So um, a lot of our philosophy is based upon delivering a great customer service experience. And that's done through both outreach and education in our greater Seattle community. Okay. Chris or Kelly, can you tell us a little bit more about, especially I know the idea of the community service officer role kind of changed when 
COVID-19 happened. Can you tell us a little bit about what a day in the life of a CSO looks like? Absolutely. So uh, we just talked about it earlier today. Um, when we come to work each day, you know, it could look entirely different. We just have to be very fluid. Um, whatever those requests are, we try to give 110% to those requests that come in through the community. Um, so a lot of our role is being out, being available to assist people that are in need. Um, so that could be a local business that's, you know, having issues with, you know, maybe uh, individuals loitering. But our philosophy is is not, again, not to enforce anything, but to educate and connect people to resources. So if there's individuals that are loitering um, at a local bu business, one of our CSOs will um, try to connect those individuals to services. And so it's more of a long-term approach about connecting people instead of enforcing rules or regulations to try to move along. Um, so again, a lot of our role is being out in the community uh, we cover the whole uh, greater Seattle area. Um, so we have officers assigned in, in the North Precinct, West Precinct, East Precinct, Southwest Precinct, and the South Precinct. So uh, five jurisdictions within the greater Seattle area. So a lot of our CSOs will, we do have access to cars, but a lot of our CSOs will foot patrol and again, just interact with people in the local community. Great, thank you, Chris. So uh, you spoke, you speak about how the CSOs will be placed uh, throughout the city in the different precincts, and um, you know the the precincts that you you mentioned. I mean, they cover also very diverse parts of the city as well. Um, so I, I understand that some of the CSOs speak multiple languages. So that's that's great. Um, will the CSOs have access to language access tools to facilitate um, relationship building with non English speakers in, in the community that they're they're serving? Definitely, um, we have 8, eight different languages are spoken within our group. And then we also have access to the language lines. And so it's not uncommon for us to get a call over are dispatched via the police radio and go out and assist with a situation where we just need to interpret a little bit, you know, just to get through the conversation, mm -hmm. explain. We do a lot of explaining and educating. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great to hear. Thank you. Yeah, as Kelly mentioned, we're really the liaison between the community and the uh, department. And so we really try to accommodate, you know, people that are, are more vulnerable and maybe don't have access to certain uh, privileges that other people may. So to answer your question, um, amongst the 13 CSOs, as Kelly mentioned, we speak seven uh, different languages, uh, Spanish, Tagalog, Punjabi, Khmer, Hindi, English, Afran, Oromo, and Amharic. So I have a follow-up question. So um, we know, you know, in, in regards to the different communities, um, we know that there's, uh, especially with the, the events that have transpired over the last few months, there's been a growing, you know, there's a growing distrust of community towards the police department. What, do you, what are some of the things that the CSOs are planning to do to gain some of that trust? Uh, because ultimately you're gonna be seen as members of the police department. Um, what are you going to do differently or what are you thinking of doing to be able to kind of connect with those communities that don't have that trust with the police department uh, or people that are coming in, un, under that department? Well, first of all, um, you know, everybody um, is entitled to their own opinion as, and as CSOs, we, we're there to listen. So um, if people want to vent and, and tell us that they don't support the police, then we're there to listen. Um, we don't pass any judgment by listening. We're hoping to bring back those ideas to the department to try to make things better, to build that trust. So it's about being um, accessible to our community, listening, and then bringing those ideas back to the department to try to provoke change. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> 
And then I uh, just want to give people a heads up that we're going to be closing the poll in a few minutes after we ask another couple of questions. So please submit your answers now so that they can be in the results when we look at them. And then, so the next question that I had was, um, when, like, when should community members contact CSOs or is there the capability for people to contact CSOs? Absolutely. So again, we do a lot of community engagement that entails uh, business checks. Um, and then each of our CSOs, we have our own work cell phone numbers and business cards. So businesses, community members will reach out to the CSOs directly uh, via our work phones. And maybe somebody doesn't, maybe something that is going on in front of their business isn't criminal related, but more about resource guidance. So we'll field calls from community members and then um, try to get out there to connect people to those resources. For example, um, I was called up north um, last week. Uh, there was an individual kind of loitering around the uh, Planet Fitness up on Aurora and the, uh, the manager of the Planet Fitness reached out to one of our CSOs about this person, you know, may look like they may be in need of services. Uh, can we have you go come up here and check it out? So uh, I, I headed up there and and spoke with the individual and was able to refer him to shelter services. Uh, we have access to bus tickets. Um, he said he had access to public transportation, but you know, if he hadn't, you know, that's something that we could provide him with and and literally connect him to those services. Thank you, Chris. And then I just wanted to mention, I saw one question in the chat. Uh, Joanna had said, I lost my poll, where is it? And I think it should be off on the right-hand side, kind of collapsed, um, unless you exited it out. And then, let me see, this is our first time using the polls. So um, then you can also, if you can't find it, click on the three dots that are next to the chat. Um, button down at the bottom and that should you should be able to select polling and it should pull it up so hopefully that works for you this is our first time trying it so um we're glad that you're trying it for the first time with us too <laughs> and then we do have a couple of other questions that are coming up in the chat for the cso's as well so we will get to those right after i think osbaldo has one more question thank you yeah so as you further mentioned throughout the, the night is that we're focusing a lot on the question of how do you define community safety and i'm going to ask you the same thing you work under the police department your role is different than a police officer you're out in community to educate how do you, and you're both welcome to answer, or one of you uh, can, you know, be the representative uh, of your voice there, uh, but how would you define community safety? Um, I think it's about getting to know your community, um, getting to know your neighbor, your businesses, community members, um, like what, what we're doing right now, um, you know, getting feedback, um, educating each other about certain issues going on that we need to that are relevant. Um, so I think it's about getting out there, engaging. Um, so we have like the community outreach, right? Which is, you know, outreaching to the community, but I think engagement's important too when you're actually collaborating together to come up with ideas is important. So that's kind of the whole idea behind community outreach. Community policing is that whole outreach and then that engagement component. So to sum it all up, it's really about knowing your community. And then I also, um, if you need to reach any of our CSOs, um, I provided our uh, spd.cso.info at seattle.gov uh, email address. So you can email us directly as far, in addition to reaching out to us via our work cell phones. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for answering that question. Um, now it's time for community questions. I know that Laura mentioned there's a couple already on the chat. We would like to invite you to unmute yourself if you are on the calling feature, uh, or also if you're also on the on your on, a, on the app, um, or to type in into the chat box to have if you any questions or anything you want to contribute to the conversation. Um, so we'll we'll let the space for people to unmute themselves and 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 speak.
So it looks like one question that came up, I don't think that we went over this yet, is what kind of training does the team get on working with people with disabilities? Do you have any access to ASL interpretation? For the language line, we would have to get the ASL interpreter set up for that. But as in like immediate access, no, we would have to arrange it. Okay. There's uh, another question from Kylie. Is, uh, is there a way to call CSOs directly versus 911 to respond when an armed officer is not needed? And you mentioned something about the phone, the phones you carry. Yeah, so um, you could contact us again through our work cell phones mm -hmm. and then through that our email address um, that I provided. So we actually have resolved a lot of um, dilemmas that have come through our uh, generic email address mm -hmm. where people in the community didn't want to uh, make a 911 call. They felt like, you know, this can be solved through a CSO response. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the things that we respond to are directly from our email. As long as it's non-emergent. Any type of emergent call definitely needs to go through 911, even if they don't feel that it's an arm, but any type of emergent. And then the officers have access to us. They'll call us as needed. Right. Okay. And the SPD underscore CSO information non-emergent is the big thing on that. Okay. And then I can't remember if we announced, but we're going to close the poll at this time. Uh, and then one question that we had was what what does emer what is emergent mean? Non-emergent, non-emergency, you know, okay. but any kind of dangerous, you know, you don't you feel threatened or suspicious something in the non-emergent that can wait, you know, that you don't need a recall, someone out there. We also had a question, I believe, Chris, you kind of talked about how CSOs are assigned to uh, the different precincts areas, um, but someone was asking if CSOs are assigned um, to, like, I think maybe neighborhoods or um, depending on language. Um, that's a good question. So obviously our, our team is very talented and they represent the greater Seattle community. So we did our best to try to assign people in the areas that they had an exper prior experience with. Um, so yes, we did take a look at um, people's prior experience in the Seattle community. And then, you know, as far as, you know, language is spoken, we did try to match it up according to uh, the need in, in the communities. What's really nice is because Seattle is so diverse, if they're working in South and we need, we need something in North, they're able to go over to assist. So you never want to lock anyone into a small area. It's, with Seattle being so diverse, you know, all areas is where we work. I have one more follow up, one more question is uh, what about um, supporting uh, small businesses? So I remember um, I've definitely seen on some online platforms of, you know, I'm having an issue with uh, someone who's like sleeping outside my my business store. Um, I don't want to instigate an, an issue uh, because of fear of whatever could happen. Do you also respond to those calls from small businesses that might not know how to handle a situation with uh, maybe you know, a belligerent customer or uh, just something that might come up where like 911 is not the right answer? Yeah, so again, a lot of our role is resource guidance, um, being the bridge to connect people to uh, different services. So uh, we've dealt with a few businesses that have had similar concerns and um, obviously our, again, our approach is to educate provide a, a high level of customer service with the business and with the patron uh, sleeping uh, in the business doorway. Again, uh, we use that as an opportunity uh, after deeming it safe, obviously safety first, but after doing that, our goal is really to 
build the rapport with the individual, build the trust, um, and then try to connect um, that individual to services if if they want. But again, we, we don't give up if they say no 90 times, right? We'll go back the 91st time and maybe that's when they want to get connected to a case manager at DESE and so forth. So again, we have outreach supplies, we have masks, we have hand warmers, uh, socks, uh, granola bars that we'll uh, hand out to people in need. So yes, that is something that we do address um, as long as it's deemed as a uh, as safe. Yeah. There's one last question in the chat. I don't don't know if we got to, but um, will I do? And I'm not sure if you two can answer this, but will 911 change out of SPD? That's a question that came up. There's been talks about it, but um, that's I would refer that to City Council. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much for um, answering all the questions. It's now. Um, a I did, Laura. Osvaldo. I did want to bring on um, big bring on Becky back on because she had an answer to the food banks question. Okay. Hi. So I did want to. Um, somebody in the chat had asked about the food bank occupancy, and I just didn't want to get it wrong. So it is uh, food banks are limited to 25% occupancy as well. Uh, in general, most of the businesses um, and organizations are going to be limited to 25% because we're. Uh, it was a way of trying to keep it equitable across the board. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Okay, so we're gonna move on um, to, and as we kind of talked about community safety with our community um, service officers, we're gonna transition to talking about the some of the poll results that we learned about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think I wanna highlight um, one answer that particularly connected also to what Chris, um, or not to Chris, but to the conversation around uh, with the CSOs is, uh, you know, this person said, "Not to, how do they define community safety? They said, it's not to be fearful of others as I move through my community. Also, not to be fearful of police officers if and when they are needed. Um, and I thought that was the, the pattern or the, the trend of, you know, as I'm, I'm community free from police violence, a place where I feel safe, where I can walk back from home. Um, safety, walking alone, uh, even when I'm not with others. Uh, there was just there's this trend of or this pattern of people defining community safety as a place where they can just be themselves, navigate their city, their neighborhood, go to work, go to go home, um, and not be fearful of others or what they can happen or what could happen to them. That's one trend I see. Alvin, Laura, do you see any other themes on the results? I'm also seeing in the first question where we asked, do you feel safe in your community? Most of the people on our call said most of the time. Um, so that's, yeah. I guess, a feeling from our small sample. <laughs> Forty percent, yeah. Forty yeah. percent most of the time. Mm -hmm. That's great. How about you, Alvin? Do you see anything? No, that's good. I saw the most of the time as well. Um, Forty percent. That's a that's a pretty big percentage. Yeah. Is anybody on the call would like to uh, contribute to how you define community safety? If you didn't have a chance to put into the poll. Um, or you just didn't want to type it into the poll, you wanted to speak it? Okay. Well, thank you so much again for, um, for participating in the poll. Um, and again, uh, to the folks from CSL program, thank you for joining us today. Um, we know that there are a lot of conversations going on across the city around the idea of public and community safety. Uh, we know that families are having these conversations. Uh, we know that teachers, students, and our elected city officials are also having these conversations. And that there's a lot of more of them to be to be had, and a lot of more work to be uh, to 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 continue moving our, our you know moving in that direction where we all can feel the safety, or we can all answer that question hopefully with 
we always feel safe in our community. So thank you for participating um, and sharing those responses. Uh, Alvin, uh, we will I'll pass it on to you. All right. So keeping our young adults safe. Tonight, we want to have a discussion with you about preventing gun violence involving our youth. Sorry, finding the, the unmute button. Um, so we've seen a rise in homicides this year in Seattle. And so far in 2020, there have been at least 36 deaths of victims ages 18 to 24 in King County. Tonight joining us is Sean Good, director of Choose 180, and Derek Wheeler-Smith, director of Zero Youth Detention, who are going to talk a little bit more about youth gun violence prevention. Sean and Derek, thank you for joining us tonight. So uh, tell us a little bit about your programs and how they participate in youth gun violence prevention efforts in Seattle and King County. Sure, Sean, I guess I can uh, kick off first. So. Uh, zero Youth Detention is uh, really a, uh, a strategic plan to improve community safety um, and achieve better outcomes for youth and families at risk of juvenile legal system involvement. And uh, the important element, I think, to that for wh where this work intersects for me is, you know, we don't want to have our focus on what do we have to do to not lock up black and brown children. I think this is really about how are we creating the conditions that sets up young people to be hopeful, to be healthy, to be happy, and to be thriving. Um, there are predictable mortality rates, um, all of our sectors for black and brown children, and gun violence is the fastest way that young people are dying. And so we really see gun violence as a go first strategy um, to being able to address uh, these other social determinants of health. And uh, we're doing that work really through uh, a public health approach. That's great. Sean, did you want to ch uh, chime in? Sure, certainly. Um, Choose 180 is a nonprofit organization that works to transform systems, communities, and lives through the power of choice. And we do that by partnering with institutional leaders like prosecutors, public defenders, and, and transform the way that they administer justice while supporting the young people that are disproportionately harmed by those systems. And we operate like an emergency room where we engage young people in these critical moments. We charge them help them get well enough and then refer them out to primary care and specialty practitioners like case managers, behavioral health specialists, mentors, tutors, employment that'll help them sustain a commitment to a new direction. And as it pertains to gun violence prevention, it really aligns with this public health way of being where we look at gun violence as a public health issue. And it, we, it, we can predict the neighborhoods that it's likely to populate in, where we can predict the young people who are likely to be impacted by it. And our organization, in partnership with Zero Youth Detention, as well as the Prosecuting Attorney's Office, has built out programming specifically targeted to engage young people who have been victims of gun violence or accused of gun violence and support them, whether exiting out of the criminal legal system or navigating their woundedness, not just the physical wounds, but also the mental and emotional wounds, um, so that way they can be healthy and whole. Uh, one thing we know with great certainty is it's often the person who was harmed today that becomes the accused tomorrow. And we can curb this cycle by intentionally engaging young people at critical moments and making sure they have the support they need to be healthy and whole in the communities they live in. Thank you both. So this question is for both of you. As I mentioned before, we've seen a rise in homicides in Seattle this year. And so looking forward to 2021, what are some of the efforts in place to try and prevent another rise next year? Well, Derek, I, I really would lean this one over to you, and I'll, I'll start by saying that anything that we look at in 2020, we have to look at through the lens of multiple issues that exacerbate gun violence. Um, when you have a lack of social system supports because of the number of young people who aren't able to access school, the number of young people who aren't able to engage in athletic programs, the number of young people who don't have their traditional social supports and as a result, find themselves engaging in problematic behavior, there's a direct correlation there. Um, furthermore, when you have young people who are living in homes that are bearing additional stress and strain because of lack of employment, um, young people who are navigating 
homes that families are stressed out, an increase in violence in the home, which can translate to an increase in violence in the streets. None of these things are independent of the other. And it's important that we see the correlation between the pandemic, both of COVID and of racism, and how that is tied into 2020 to the increase in gun violence that we see in the community. But there is a comprehensive approach being rolled out and, and the work that Derek Wheeler-Smith is doing through Zero Youth Detention is spearheading an approach called the RAM approach that he's much better, better positioned to speak about. Derek, you're on mute. I just, it has to happen at least once every call. So you get to win <laughs> the, the, the bingo square this time. Uh, yeah. Because I think when you both are unmuted, there's some feedback that's coming through too. All right, are y'all able to hear me now? Yes. Great. Uh, I was saying thank you, Sean, for that. Much like COVID-19, uh, youth and uh, young adult gun violence is a fatal epidemic, and it and it must be uh, destigmatized uh, and treated really in order to ensure long-term community health. Gun violence in our neighborhoods, our cities, and county really impacts public health and public safety, and it has to be addressed and deserves to be addressed through a robust public health approach that enlists multi-sector supports, broad investments, and a lasting commitment uh, really being able to address this issue. And so um, we are really strategically looking at and organizing, as Sean mentioned, uh, a framework um, that allows us to use common language and practice and protocols and co-created accountability measures to provide comprehensive care and support for the highest risk young people uh, and their families. Uh, and so we recognize that uh, we cannot find or do this work without recognizing our interdependence across these different domains and across our different sectors. And if we really look at and recognize and see this as a symptom to a broader issue through a public health approach, we know that any effective solutions to reducing some of these challenges must be comprehensive. And so we're dedicated to advancing the treatment of gun violence as a public health issue. And uh, we believe that we're uniquely positioned to enculturate the kind of solutions and enlist support across these different sectors that uh, engage in order to make meaningful and lasting change. And so that sustainability requires the kind of multi-sector engagement, political leadership, um, advocacy and championship and meaningful buy-in from stakeholders from grassroots to grass tops. And so rather than funding a small subset of services, we believe that a regional approach can call for the kind of alignment, capital alignment of resources and assets to build a robust model that truly interrupts violence. Um, and as I mentioned, creates lasting change. So what does that look like? It's violence interruption and community led crisis response. It's victim recovery support services, um, including rehabilitation, which can, which can be mental, financial, physical, um, and a plethora of other ways. Uh, skilled outreach and service linkage, case management and safety planning risk assessment, family supports, including, you know, housing, health, uh, funeral and vigil supports, uh, recreation and enrichment programs, and uh, the well-being of services. So this is something that, again, requires a comprehensive approach and multiple folks all coming together because this can't be solved by one organization, by one sector, by one department, by one program. And by bringing all of these system partners together, I think it takes some of the pressure and onus off of the community because programs like Choose 180 can continue to do a remarkable job with young people. The problem is, is that they're then forced to send that child or that young person back into the same environment that made them sick in the first place. So how are we addressing these social determinants of health um, that sets up young people to be happy, healthy, and thriving in their communities? Thank you, Derek. Um, so some of the things you said kind of struck a chord with me um, because I've been talking to a lot of people out in community, especially um, with issues around like shootings in Rainier Beach, particularly. Um, what are some things that community can do to get involved um, like in their neighborhoods or how can they interface with you guys to uh, create solutions? Well, one of the things that's uh, essential for us and that we believe is that uh, community-based alternatives and community solutions really are the way to go. And so sitting at the core of this work really is community accountability. Uh, and so one of the ways that folks can engage um, are by participating in some of the different opportunities through this regional approach, um, as there are different opportunities for community members to be able to engage in the various committees um, that will be launched in 
um, conjunction with this regional approach, right? I think that there are significant roles that different people can play, um, but it would be the equivalent, I think Sean talked about and used the analogy of kind of um, an emergency room. Well, there's different people that are allowed at different spaces in the hospital, right? Like, as much as I love my mom, if I were to have to have a surgery, I don't want her operating on me, right? Because that's not her role. And so I think that there are distinct roles um, that we have outlined and opportunities for engagement um, that can allow people to engage in a, in a plethora of ways. Um, and folks are able to uh, make those connections by uh, reaching out to us uh, at uh, through, through King County Public Health and uh, the zero youth detention work. Um, and then there are these community based organizations who are who are also right engaged uh, in this work. Um, we have RAM partners um, across these different South King County jurisdictions, folks like community passageways, uh, progress pushers, uh, YMCA with the alive and free program uh, is also plugged in. And so these are there's a plethora of organizations and there's tons of ways uh, for folks to get involved by either reaching out directly to those organizations or to King County. Uh, Zero youth detention through public health. And Alvin, if I may, um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll add and say it, it's a shared responsibility that we have in the community to see our young people as possibilities to be developed and not problems to be solved. Right. So often we begin to criminalize the behavior of black children at an early age. And when we begin that process of criminalization, it tends to lead down a path that very rarely. Uh, provides the space for them to see themselves as what they can be, but stigmatizes them as something that they've done. Uh, on average, black children are aged four to six years older than what they are by the perception of those that carry that bias. So when you have a 12 year old or 14 year old in the community doing something that all adolescents do, but because they live in a neighborhood that's overly policed, it's determined to be a crime, then all of a sudden you have a young person who's looking at themselves through the lens of being criminal and it's one step closer to committing more criminal acts that that's the way the world around them already views them. And I believe in all of our neighborhoods, particularly the neighborhoods that are quickly changing as a result of gentrification and folks who are moving into neighborhoods that are historically black neighborhoods and neighborhoods that historically housed a, a population of people who have a diversity of incomes and, and opportunities and access to opportunities to be really conscientious of how we activate law enforcement and how we choose to be present as people in the community versus as folks who are intimidated by our community. Uh, I encourage everybody, if you live in South Seattle, Central Seattle, West Seattle, to really find yourselves being in relationship with the very people that you may be intimidated by and work through your own personal biases to understand why that intimidation exists in the first place. So often our children are being criminalized at an early age and that early criminalization leads down a path of destruction that never allows them to truly be healed, healthy, and full of hope. And work like ours exists to help young people pivot early on so they can begin to see themselves as what's possible. And that work is only affirmed when community members like all of you also look at those young people and see them as what they can be instead of stigmatizing them for what they've done. Thank you, Sean. Wow, yeah, thank you. Um, so one thing with the pandemic this year, how do you think COVID-19 and the switch to online learning impacts youth and the work that you all do? Derek, you want me to go first? Uh, I, I can tap in. Um, you know, I think that, I think ultimately it really, it, it exacerbates, um, I think, some already perplexing challenges and problems. I think that you have um, young people who are really moved by and need um, relationship. I think if we were to think about in terms of a value system, uh, relationship sits at the, at the crux and at the top of that value system. And I think the challenge is, is that now the focus has shifted to an object. Right. And the object is this online platform um, that I think pushes kids a bit further away. And so I imagine even for kids who need that engagement in that relationship, they feel completely disconnected. I mean, the data is in and I think, you know, there's a little more than half of young people who are even logging in to online school. Um, and so the inability, I think, to be able to have the relational connection um, and to be able to share space with people. Uh, in ways that have that hold so much meaning, um, I think presents barriers and challenges. 
I also think that people have been able to navigate out of spaces that have been complex. Unfortunately, this happens in so many young people's homes. And so now folks are forced to have to spend time in places that maybe they only had to spend a little bit of time in before. Um, and that has also uh, increased trauma and mental health issues and other factors that young people were once able to kind of access through these other spaces and places, whether that was actually in the school building or through a program like Choose 180 or Community Passageways, who've held some of these more programmatic uh, opportunities. And so I think we have just had to, folks have had to restructure, right, and re-strategize uh, their engagement uh, to find opportunities to be able to connect with young people. One thing is clear, it hasn't stopped gun violence, right? And that's something that has um, continued to rise. And like any disease, it needs attention, has to be treated. Um, if not, it'll continue to spread. You know, I, uh, I mentioned uh, when we were, before we got started, I was doing introductions that I'm the father of two teenage children. I have a, a 19, almost 19 year old who's taking college classes uh, online from my dorm room in, in Ellingsburg, which is a conversation for another day, uh, why I'm paying for a child to take virtual classes from a college dorm room. Um, that's it's complicated. And then I have a 13 year old uh, who's in eighth grade and and I regularly joke and say that she's learning more from TikTok than she is from her online classes. Now, my kids are fortunate to grow up in a house where they have lots of support, um, lots of attention being paid. They have a dedicated space. I mean, my son in his dorm room, but my daughter in her room where she can tap into online learning and and she's doing pretty well academically and, and getting the affirmation she needs to know that she can be successful and flourish in that space. Uh, so many of our young people have a challenge functioning in a traditional classroom space because of a variety of different reasons. And so the virtual space only exacerbates those issues, which then speaks to a challenge in identity and, and finding self-worth showing up to a platform that doesn't value you and you don't see value in it because you can't perform in it. So where else do you show up? What are the other places where you can go where you do find value, where people do value you? What are the places that you can occupy where you are affirmed? And what do those look like in the midst of a pandemic? They become far and few between and, and the options become far less in communities that can't get together in community hub groups and, and, and have little uh, groups where you're co-educating with your peers and, and have other alternative options that you can be able to still engage in pro-social activities in the midst of a pandemic. So for many of the young people who are getting caught up in this disease of violence, it's because they're so much more susceptible as a result of all these other social determinants. You know, it's the same conversation we have about masks, right? Like if you wear a mask and the person next to you wears a mask, then you're both less likely to spread the disease. It doesn't mean that it won't happen. It means that you're far less likely. But if resourced with masks, then it's less likely you're going to spread the disease and we're likely to flatten the curve. Well, communities given the resources necessary to be able to protect themselves from the spread of the disease of violence are far less likely to engage in violent behavior. We know communities like that throughout the city of Seattle. We see what happens. Uh, look at Columbia City, for example, a community that was given the mask as a result of a large portion of gentrification and, and a ton of resources flooded into that neighborhood. And now violence looks far different in Columbia City today than what it did 15, 20 years ago. Um, how do we provide masks, or in this case, resources to communities that otherwise wouldn't have access to them. So they can simply make sure they have the preventative measures in place, upward mobility, a shrink in the wage and equity gap, ac quality education, P P PSTAs that are, that are equally funded and allowing each schools to have resource and access to additional teachers if necessary, all of the things that keep a, a community safe and healthy. How do we make sure all communities have that? And then in turn, our young people benefit because they grow up in those communities and they're safe and healthy spaces for them as well. Thank you, Sean and Derek. So now we're gonna move on to uh, our guest here so they can ask a couple questions. And it looks like we had a few in the chat. I think Sean was pretty busy in the chat and answered. Um, so Catherine had mentioned, um, if I have a neighbor family having some challenges with their teenage child and there are concerns one hears of young people hanging out, is there an avenue to see programming from organizations to facilitate better choices for young people, um, especially if parents are not trusted? And Sean said, 
I'm not sure of the specifics of the situation, but our organization does take community referrals. And so, and then he said, you can find out more at www.choose180.org. Sean, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? No, I, I, I think that stands for anybody that's uh, participating in the call tonight that um, there, we all encounter one-offs. And I do think the best re re response you can have is how do we activate a community-based organization instead of how can we activate law enforcement in those moments? And so if there's an opportunity to activate a community organization, then please reach out to us. Uh, and we're more than happy to see if it's something that we can support and if otherwise identify the right service providers in the community that can lean in and, and help out with that particular situation. You know, we it's our conviction that public safety shouldn't hinge on whether or not we have police in communities. Um, we know of communities that are incredibly safe that are absent of police presence the majority of the times. We, we, we call them the suburbs. And when police are activated in those spaces, it's typically for things like uh, property damage or noise complaints or mail theft. And, and we know that differs from when police are activated in communities that, uh, that have greater socioeconomic disparities. And so it's our conviction that communities can be safe without the same presence of police by having an increased presence of community-based providers. And, and so I really encourage anybody that's on the call tonight watching this, that if you have concerns about young people, please feel free to reach out to our cause. And if we're not the answer, we can find other organizations that can partner with you because we are steadfast and committed to making sure that young people have the opportunity to be first seen as a possibility before they're stigmatized as a problem. That's great. All right, do we have any uh, more questions? Okay, sounds like uh, we don't have any more questions here. And we waited for the, the awkward silence to be done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, Thank you, Sean, and, and thank you, Derek, for uh, coming on to the show tonight. Um, we appreciate all of your insight. Um, and uh, they, I believe you guys both left your uh, information in the chat for folks to contact you. Oh, it looks like we might have someone. Oh, I think Derek just put something in the chat. Yeah, he just said um, zero youth detention convenes and partners with CBOs across <clears throat> community based organizations across King County, but doesn't provide direct service and then put the link um, to their website. Perfect, perfect. Thank you guys for joining the show with us. We're going to transition on to our, uh, our next uh, episode here. Oswaldo? Yeah, and before we transition, I wanted to, we missed a question on the chat. Oh, do we? Uh, from Lev. And um, your question, Lev, is how many houses could be built with the salaries of everyone on this call? And I just wanted to open it up and, and give you an opportunity to, to if you wanted to elaborate a little more, I'm not sure how to answer the question, but maybe we could provide a little more clarification. If you're able to speak, um, you can unmute yourself. And if you're not able to speak, feel free to uh, provide more uh, context in the chat. So you might be either typing or unable to to um, verbally uh, con provide more context to the question. You know what I I still think it's a little bit challenging to answer for myself. I encourage you to uh, reach out to city council. I reach out to I encourage you to reach out to the mayor's office, folks that are boarded in into the city leadership, um, and to have a conversation about budgets. We unfortunately don't have control and don't uh, manage budgets for the city, but. I encourage you to bring this conversation into a conversation. And I think that highlights why conversations are very important to have. And having here Sean Good and Derek Willer and having those folks in community uh, being able to transform the lives of young people, you know, I'm sure I'm 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 glad that they have a salary to be able to make that opportunity for, for young people across the city uh, and the families that they're touching. But anything regarding the budget or questions with salaries, we encourage you to bring that conversation. It's a truth in a conversation that you feel needs to be had, reach out to city council or the mayor's office for that. Um, but thank you for putting it in there. And now we can move on to our next segment. And it's for me. Um, the surge in COVID-19 cases and colder weather are making life even harder for our neighbors who are unhoused. 
Tonight, Community Conversations wanted to provide a space to talk with a community partner on the front lines of homelessness about what her organization's vision and mission is. Happy to have Melanie, happy to have Melanie Newfield with Lake City Partners Ending Homelessness join us this evening. Melanie, tell us about your organization's mission statement. Great. Well, really grateful to be with you today and for this kind of forum that you're experimenting with during this time. Uh, Lake City Partners uh, is rooted in the neighborhood of Lake City, though um, we've expanded as we've seen need uh, in the North King County area. Uh, we're a really underserved area of the of the, the community. Um, and that's how things really emerged. Um, so faith communities really were were being responsive to people experiencing homelessness and out of uh, regular meetings uh, through our task force on homelessness in Lake City on the second Friday of every month. Um, we've been able to work together as a community and I really appreciated what uh, Derek had to say in the last segment about um, uh, multi sector solutions. Let's work together as as a community. It can't be just one organization that that comes up with a solution. We really need to have everybody involved and engaged in thinking about solutions to end homelessness. So a few a few of the things that we do, we focus on engagement, uh, building relationship, and that's also something that that Chris talked about as the community service officer. That um, in order to you know really be with somebody and and understand their concerns and needs, there's there needs to be an opportunity to build trust, and so. Um, some of that that work that we do is is our day center. So we have a day center that was actually named by our community in Lake City called God's Little Acre. It was one safe place that that people could be in in the neighborhood and uh, a place where where folks can get basic needs. So showers, laundry. Uh, they can meet people. They can cook their own food there. Uh, that's that's um, one place um, we do street outreach as well. And and we also over time have built the capacity to to offer shelter. And and so, yeah, that's that's a br briefer introduction. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Yeah, well, thank you, Melanie. Yeah, I so I know that the Lake City Task Force on Homelessness recently put out a report titled Let's Keep People Alive. Um, and can you tell us a little more about this report and then what did the report find on what are the biggest needs for the unhoused community besides housing? For sure. So we've been gathering information because we know that there are groups responding to the encampments in Lake City. So if you've been through Lake City, you will see behind the library, a large encampment, as well as the heart of Lake City at 125th and Lake City Way. There's a large encampment there. And that has been a bit of a lightning rod for the whole community to to all of a sudden see um, homelessness so visible. And those encampments have been allowed to stay because of CDC guidelines uh, that's telling, telling the community not to move people um, for fear of spread of COVID. And, and so folks are have really rooted themselves in, in the Lake City area in those encampments. And so it really felt like um, this is a time to really get a sense of, well, how are we supporting people now in the colder wet weather? And uh, and so some of the um, the groups, you know, have really been um, noticing what what is needed because with the colder weather, uh, warming stations. You know, if folks had access to warming stations, they could stay stay warmer. Um, Right now, they're using uh, the little 18-hour hand, hand warmers and uh, trying to keep themselves warm that way. Um, phone charging stations. Uh, these these folks ha have access or have their own phones, but don't have access to power. And that you know, really, they need to stay connected to their their resources in their community. Uh, running water, we we take that for granted in our homes. Uh, <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to be able to drink, but also to wash hands. That has been, you know, one of the biggest orders is to wash your hands multiple times, all the time, every day, whenever you touch something, you know, pay attention. And and if folks don't have access to that running water, that, you know, how are, how are they supposed to stay safe in that same way? Um, certainly showers and more toilets are welcome to, to really um, make sure that there's uh, proper sanitation. Uh, access to public health. I know there's a mobile health um, van that, that goes around, but that that's, you know, comes to the neighborhood maybe once a month. Um, folks have access to hot meals maybe once a day, but they probably would appreciate uh, more hot meals as well as uh, our drop-in center. Um, because of increased costs of COVID, we're needing to reduce our hours. Uh, I want to shout out to all of our essential workers that have kept our shelter open, kept our day center open, and have continued to do outreach during this time. We have not missed one day of being open in our day center. So, uh, yeah, that's a big commitment from staff to, to be exposed, but also to, yeah, like think about what the encampments really need. Um, basic needs, I think, is is really critical right now. Thank you, Thank you, Melanie. Um, so you touched on uh, some of um, the encampments and things um, up in Lake City, um, and I'm a firm believer in you know we're we're not gonna we're not gonna solve this homeless situation overnight or in a week, a month, year, maybe even. But I'm a firm believer in every little bit counts. How can uh, the community positively posit positively get involved with um, your your organization? Sure. Well, I've had lots of folks reach out to me. Um, to ask, you know, what what they can um, offer. Um, certainly, you know, the basic needs of socks and underwear. Um, Gaza Laker is constantly taking in donations, warm clothing, um, gloves, hats. Um, all of those things are welcome, as well as hygiene supplies. Uh, folks can use the the restrooms at Gaza Laker uh, and 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 get a chance to shower and and do their laundry so so they can use those products at at the drop-in center um certainly the advocacy piece is really huge we believe our city could do more to really support the encampment support those folks that are outside um we've we have seen you know that that shelters it's been really challenging for people to get into shelter um, because of some of the restrictions, um, there's a requirement maybe to quarantine or or to not have any symptoms uh, when folks show up. Um, there's just been more more challenge, or they have to have a COVID test before they're allowed to to get into shelter. Um, we also, you know, just learned about the Soto area is opening 300 beds with Salvation Army. So we're hoping, yeah, that that more folks can can receive that support. So advocacy for more shelter beds, more housing uh, options, um, and and how do we keep people alive in these encampments? Thank you. Um, well, you, you, you touched a little bit on this, Melanie, uh, in your opening um, questions, but how has the pandemic, how has COVID-19 affected the way that you provide the services to um, the folks out, out, outside? Well, you mentioned like the CDC guidelines of not moving encampments, uh, but what about like your the way that you you know serve the the, the folks? For sure, we we really had to shift. Uh, a lot of our staff were um, in that vulnerable category of you know older adults, and so we we saw a huge transformation in having to find new staff to to. Um, there. Luckily, there are a lot of young people showed up and and wanted to to be a part of of the project. So, um, so you know that full turnover, then having to train and and um, staff up and start basically start from scratch with a with a new new group. Um, certainly, you know, with COVID, we really have to um pay attention to the sanitation of of a facility and so we had to shift our program from like being open door anybody can come in between nine and four um to you know folks come to the door they sign up for a slot they're allowed to be in for um to the day center for two two hours at a time 
and they have to wear a face mask. We take the temperature at the at the door, um, but and we only allow 15 people in at a time. Mm -hmm. um, we have a half an hour break in between shifts where uh, staff and volunteers are sanitizing the whole space. And yeah, folks are really paying attention then to to you know reminding people about keeping their their masks on and and paying attention to you know what what is being touched the the high touched objects and mm -hmm. uh certainly you know the way we pr offer food has been different um folks come into our facility and they often um are able to cook their own food uh we're seeing a lot more people um don't bring donations uh in rather and so folks are doing less cooking of their own food but then um you know the the portions are individually wrapped as a way to keep people safe and not breathing on kind of a buffet of food that's that's left on the counter so we're you know really thinking about food safety and as as a way to to do do things differently and keep people safe yeah, yeah. It's all about shifting and adapting, right? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. I should mention just one more thing. Um, you know, we have had a congregate shelter model um, mm. where folks have slept on the floor in a church basement. We know that that solution no longer is, is reasonable. Um, mm -hmm. So we are so excited. King County and uh, City of Shoreline are joining us, Lake City Partners, in, in opening an old nursing home. So everyone will be able to have their own room. Uh, oh, we feel right. like that will um, offer people dignity and, and safe, have just a way safer experience. Uh, wow. So we're, we're hoping, you know, shortly in December to to be able to open that space and really excited about what we can offer people there. That's great. That's awesome news. Alvin? Mm -hmm. So Melody, uh, what is one of the biggest myths about the uh, unhoused community that you would say? Wow. You know, I didn't get a script for this, everybody. So <laughs> I get, get, I'm getting put on the spot here. So one of the biggest myths, um, you know, I think it, yeah, relates to to perception and 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 thinking about that. You know, homelessness equals you know someone who's involved in criminal activity. Those two are 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 joined together, and that that really you know should is a myth that should be dispelled. Um, folks, really, you know, a, a lot of them friends on the street who you know, I've gotten to know fell on hard times because of a health condition, loss of employment, uh, increased rents. Uh, there's just such a multifaceted reasons why people become homeless and it's not because they were, you know, criminals in the first place. So, sorry, I can't articulate it super well, but I, yeah, I think that's that's one of the, the biggest challenges that we have. Yeah. That's, that's and, uh, you're right. Well, sorry for putting you on the spot, but you, I think you you did a really good job in answering all of our questions. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. And we know that the weather and, you know, the pandemic is not making things easier for the folks outside and for community providers like you. Um, we appreciate the work that you're all doing in our community. Um, and, you know, a reminder that you are doing life saving and and life-changing work. So thank you for, for all that. We're gonna open it up to the folks to see if they have any questions for you or anything they'd like to contribute. Um, and then, yeah, so we'll open it up with a little bit of silence. And then if you want to unmute yourself, feel free or uh, go ahead and type in your questions into the chat box. I don't see any questions in the chat box. I just see a thank you from uh, Sam and that they're excited for the new space up in uh, with the Shoreline and King County partnership. That is very good. Um, well, I think we can, um, thank you so much. We can wrap up your time here, Emily. Thank you again for joining us this evening. I hope that people um, had an opportunity to learn more about the work that you're doing out in Lake City. 
Great. Thank you it's, so much. Yeah, really good to have an opportunity to talk about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you and um, to wrap up, we just wanted to mention. So we've well, been. Sorry. Sorry, Melanie, oh, yeah. there, was, there was a question that came up very last minute, and I want to ask, yeah. sorry, Laura, um, yeah. how are the faith-based communities being able to contribute now? How can faith-based communities um, help contribute now, I think? Well, we have a couple of ways that the faith community has, has been super involved already, which is really great. Uh, so we have meals that come to the shelter. So right now our rotating shelter, the mats on the floor shelter is uh, is at Lake City Presbyterian. Uh, we do have a sign up. Um, so if you want to um, contact at lakecitypartners.org, I can get you more information about our meal sign up. We have um, folks or groups um, offering meals for our 20 folks that are staying at Lake City Prez right now. Um, so there's a volunteer sign up for that. Um, December 1st, we're going to be starting a physical distance painting project at the Oaks to get it ready for, for the 24-7 shelter uh, at, at the Oaks on Aurora. And so if um, you want to bring your own bubble, um, you, you know, your household that you live together, um, you can get a room that you can paint your yourself um, and and physically distance with with other people. So uh, oh, that cool. sign up will also be available shortly. We want to start that painting December 1st. So thanks for the question. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, that's pretty thank cool. You again, Melanie, and thank you for the question, Carol. OK, Laura, now I will give it up to you. <laughs> OK, and so we've been talking a lot about community safety tonight. We just wanted to mention one opportunity through this is through Seattle University and um, Seattle Police Department. Esprit, can you move on to the next slide? And um, it's a, a public safety survey that they put out every year, and it's open um, October 15th through November 30th. And I, I'll just paste the the link in the chat too. Um, but the the input that's received through the survey um, gets put into the micro community policing plans, um, which are available on um, Seattle Police Department's website. And these surveys are available in Amharic, Arabic, Chinese, English, Korean, Oromo, Somali, Spanish, Tagalog, Tigrinya, and Vietnamese. I just wanted to list those just so that people are aware of what languages they're available in. Um, so that's another opportunity. If you liked our poll, um, this is a different um, a different group leading a survey that's around public safety and community safety. All right, so I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, next steps, we want to hear from you. What issues would you like for us to explore in your community? Would you like to join us for a conversation? If you would like to get in touch with us and be a part of the conversation, please email us at don underscore cec at seattle.gov. Oswaldo. Yeah, I mean, tonight we had some amazing speakers. I've learned a lot about, you know, Choose 180, the work that Derek and Sean are doing, and obviously Melanie and the CSOs, uh, very informative program. So thank you for joining us tonight as well. Definitely. And we want you to be a part of the conversation. So remember, this has been created for you and about you. And our next community conversation is plans for the second Wednesday of December. December 9th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. So I'm Laura Jenkins. I'm Alvin Edwards. And I'm Oswaldo Hernandez from the Department of Neighborhoods. Thank you everyone for joining the conversation and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Spreet. You are welcome. <laughs> you did oh, really good. Rosa?